Hello, it's Svetlana and you're listening to Story Verzi. Stay tuned for more fun festive stories. Thank you. Welcome to the Story Worthy Podcast. Here are your hosts, Christine Blackburn and Hannah Stinney. Welcome to Storyworthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm here with Hannah Sfinney, and we're at Shorewood Intermediate School, which covers the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade in Shorewood, Wisconsin. We're right outside rooms uh, A and B, which were our big rooms. And one day in the 7th grade, all the girls went into room A, and all the boys <laughs> went into room B, and then magic happened. And that's where we are right now. Okay, so you're talking about, what was it, the gymatorium? The- no, no, no. They would have two big... Me- they cut... You know how you have a big meeting room? Right. But you can put a, a divider down the middle. Right. It's attached to the roof. <laughs> so they, since we were getting the sex talk, they put all the boys on one side of the partition and all the girls on the other side. Okay, okay, okay. So and the reason we're coming from here because is... Because our topic tonight is a visit from Aunt Flo. And that comes from Arise Barr, who is an actress, a writer, a producer, and she... And woman. And she creates content Life all force. the time. She does. Yeah, she's yes. amazing. And this is her story. So I know it's going to be good. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be fantastic. Everything she does, everything she touches is gold. Let's face it. <laughs> That's pretty much right. Yeah. Uh, but boy, menstruation. Do you, you do remember that then in junior high school. We were in sixth grade. Yeah, they could barely, uh, I think it was, yeah, I'm saying, yeah, seventh, seventh. We were in sixth grade, and yeah, the girls got put into one room, and the boys got put into the other room, and then from there from there on out, we, and I remember we had this teacher named Mr. Scheid, and he says to the classroom, the, the in sixth grade class, he says, vagina, vagina, there, get it out, start laughing, <laughs> penis, Penis, <laughs> get it out, laugh. And he was just like being a complete dick like that. And then, of course, we did laugh. Well, I think that's actually brilliant because I think I think I did like a gig once, like 10 years ago, where it was like, I don't know why, it was a bunch of high schoolers. Somebody said, hey, you want to fill in some time? I'm right? like, sure, I'm a stage whore. And it's like, I just went, penis, vagina, poop. <laughs> just uh, I was just saying things to see whether they would... Um, React at all. The react at all, right? Well, that's what he did. But uh, anyway, so I. Re- but I do remember that talk. Now I'm glad I got some information at school because my mother told me nothing. I told you that, right? Yes. Which again, you are the youngest of five girls and six children, and. Yet, by the time your period was coming, nobody gave a shit anymore. No, everybody everybody was off to college. Everybody had checked out. But none of your sisters decided well, to give you any info. Okay, so he, let, let me just say this. I will tell you this information. My brother, one of his chores was to burn the trash. That's mm-hmm. right. We lived in rural Pennsylvania, and we burned our trash in the backyard. Was this white trash? No, this is the trash. This is literally, we would take our garbage, my yeah. brother would take it down back, and he would burn it. Okay. Yeah. So me and my sister, he would call me and my sister Tracy, we're his little sisters, he would call us down to the trash and he would open up my sister's bloody pads and he would say, you see this? That's what's going to happen to you. Oh. And he would shove them in our face and then throw it in the burning barrel. Wow. So that was, that was my education. I'm amazed that you've ever had sexual intercourse after a story like that. <laughs> that mean, is my that's sisters tell horrifying. me nothing. My mother tells me nothing. That's my, the part I can't my get. My brother is the... makes me think I'm going to be <clears throat> cut every month. Hey, at least he gave you some information. It may have been wrong, but it's like, why? Yeah, where are your sisters? Where's your mom in this? This is know. crazy. Talk. I don't know, but Aunt Flo, that is one well, way. Well, you remember last we, a few weeks it. ago we had the wonderful Jackie Cation in here, right? And she's saying uh, her mom, who was a lot of fun in a lot of ways, but not interested in children at all, <laughs> gave her no information about tampons at all and, like, didn't, like, she thought you just took the whole thing right, so and just put it in there. Right, so she was trying to put the applicator, in, she was trying to yeah. insert the entire applicator. She didn't even know, you know what I mean? In other words, her mother right, didn't did not, say, un, it's under a the device. package, say, this is the cotton, it has a string on it, this is what's going to do. Right. She, she didn't do that. Well, and he I put it in, and for God's sakes, don't light it because it's like a, it's like the fuse <laughs> of a stick of dynamite in a cartoon. Now, as I'm older, I don't call it menstruation as much. I've been calling it um, when the Taliban visits. Okay. You know, like the Taliban's coming. That's that's kind of the indication that I give right now. 
Aunt Flo, that's what that's the way. I think that's exactly. And I don't know if Aris said that or we made that up for the story. I don't remember. No, no, no. That's a very that. old phrase. That's an old phrase. No, I know yeah. that. Yeah, I know that. Uh, OK, so my daughter, she's only six. I haven't told her anything yet. However, I will say this. Mm-hmm. I've talked to her about the holes that sure. she has. All the holes. The ins, the outs. You right. know, and I explained that the boys only have two, the two holes. Yeah. So, you know, I'm just trying to give some information. I, I want to warm her up to the big, you yes, know. Yes, the big. No, no, no. I think your your daughter and, and most girls of that generation will have a tremendous amount of information because it's like, it's just as funny as it may sound if a 10-year-old girl accidentally hears you know, some female comic doing menstruation jokes, I think that's actually good in a way because it makes it <laughs> like this is what ha- this is normal. This is something we make fun of. This okay, is goofy. Right. It's not but what are you like some that hidden that horrible it? subject where it's like, you know, that was the old days where it's like this is, you know, despite being the most important thing in the reproduction of the entire frickin' species, <laughs> but it's actually that, hidden, like it's bad and dirty and but wrong. But also they can just Google it, and that will give them quick Yeah, they, they'll you have, have some the idea that this is, and, and there'll be some women out there just going like, yeah, you know, God forbid, yeah, they'll see the view, and they'll be like, meh, 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 and Barbara Waltz will be like, <laughs> I remember when I had my last period in 1913, <laughs> well, I had to put a model Ford between my legs. Hey, folks, I wanted to remind you that if you'd like to support the podcast, boy, that would be great. Yeah, and after that, you know, little bit, I'm sure you're really excited. <laughs> but you could uh, go to our website, storywiththepodcast.com, and click on the Amazon ad and buy your uh, tampons, <laughs> and we would get a little taste. Okay, that's oh, about. Okay, okay. That sorry, is sorry. Horrible. We could get a little bit of the money that you and you won't cost you anything extra. Right. But we will know that you're having your period. <laughs> <laughs> we will sit and think about it. All right, folks. Th- really, though, we do appreciate it when you go through storyworthypodcast.com when you shop on Amazon. It helps out the podcast tremendously. All right, you guys. Listen, we got to If great you're sh- having a period, you're not allowed to come, though. I'm sorry. <laughs> that is a rule that we have. No we one, no have- one, we are afraid that bears will come down out of the, out of the Santa Monica Mountains and attack us all. So no we menstruating podcast. We have a great storyteller here tonight. She's written a couple of books. She's very talented, and you are in for a treat. So, folks, wherever you are, stay tuned because if Reese Barr is on her way here. Hey everybody, it's Raylan Casper White. You are listening to Story Worthy. And we're back. Uh, we have left the Sherwood Intermediate School. We've gone uh, up around the corner, and now we're at Sherwood High School. And What's we're just standing difference? on the lawn. Ugh, there are two. The... One is 6, 7, and 8. Right. And then the high school is 9, 10, 11, 12. I know, but why would we leave the auditorium? It was like a field trip. I had forgotten that there is a restraining order against me <laughs> at my old intermediate school, uh, which I'm not allowed on the grounds anymore. It's been a long time, so I'd really <laughs> forgotten. And then I was asking a bunch of 12-year-old girls about their menstruation, and they said, you need to leave the property <laughs> immediately. Okay, okay, fair enough. All right, you guys, we have got a great storyteller here, Aris Barr. She is an actress, a comedian, a director, a writer, and producer. All of those things, Hannes. All those things and adorable. And adorable. She has appeared on shows such as Friends, Curb Your Enthusiasm, and King of Queens. And she played uh, one of the lead roles in the film Larry the Cable Guy. Remember that, Honest? Oh, no, I remember. I actually watched that only because Arise was in it. Right. Um, I was like, wow, I don't need to watch Larry the Cable Guy be a food inspector. And then I'm like, what? Wait. wait. And, and I still look at the picture and it's uh, he's health inspector yeah something like that yeah, yeah. and it's like whatever but I, I look at the picture i'm like is that a reese bar is his partner i'm like this is the greatest thing <laughs> i know and i had to watch that it was I it's actually so very funny you I saved that, that whole film all right Arisa, uh, she's currently <laughs> executive producing writing directing and starring in her original series svetlana now it's based on her character svetlana a russian lady of the night and also a political consultant. The character is so darn funny, Hannes. Yeah. It's so tight. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, and it's her right. show her show is being produced by Mark Cuban, so that's a good thing. Uh, you can find her at arisbar.org. Arisbar, I-R-I-S-B-A-H-R. Right. You org. think it's Iris, but it's not Iris. No. And if you say Iris, she will slap she you will. so she hard. Will. Uh, she's also on the Twitter. You can follow her there at Madam Svetlana. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are, put your hands together for Iris Bar. Thank you. 
Okay, this is an excerpt from Machu Mai Picchu, my memoir of my travels through South America. Chapter 17, it began in Africa. In preparation for our jaunt this evening to the dance club Mama Africa, Talia and I don our most asset-accentuating outfits. I wear my damn-her-ass-looks-good tight jeans and my roomie can't-quite-tell-how-big-her-boobs-are t-shirt. While Talia wears her roomie, she might have an ass-it's-hard-to-say jeans and a holy-shit-look-at-those-jugs tight t-shirt. <laughs> most men probably wish they could cut and paste us together. But lucky for us, we're in South America and the pickings are slim. It's nice to be big fish in a small pond. Why choose otherwise? I can't imagine working at a modeling agency or hanging out in Sweden or Ukraine. The damage to one's self-esteem would be devastating. Even brief visits to these locales borders on masochism. Mama Africa is a cramped underground cave with wood-paneled walls, a low ceiling, lots of sweaty backpackers, and 80s music. Talia and I stroll in. All eyes turn to us. Actually, Natalia's breasts, which of course have the advantage over my ass, which happens to be behind my body. I should have walked in backward. Note to self for next time. The high school dance standards pound away. Superstition, respect in the name of love. Within seconds, Talia's dancing with a narrow Israeli dude of Yemenite descent. He has a cute face but squiggly, chemically-assisted blonde hair. I'm left dancing with myself, feeling stupid. Oh, God. Bohemian Rhapsody just started. Kill me now. Perfect time to pee. Someone has been in the bathroom forever. Going in now is almost as scary as when people leave the toilet lid down. Lifting it up without knowing what's lurking inside the bowl is as terrifying as unprotected sex in Rio. Finally, the culprit emerges. Holy Christ, he's a local. The most gorgeous local I've ever seen. The guy Mel Gibson would cast if he were making Apocalypto, a love story. It's as if Johnny Depp, Clive Owen, and an Inca sperm donor had a child together. Luscious olive skin, broad shoulders, long, shiny black hair, big brown eyes, a perfect Roman nose, and remarkably appealing teeth. He eyes me for a beat. God damn it, woman, why didn't you wait with your ass facing the door? Don't you learn? <laughs> que linda, he says, admiring my face. I forgot about my face. It's not so bad, apparently. His name is Raul, and he is a Cusconian. Cusquino, Cusac, whatever, he's hot. And he's clearly smitten with me. Thank the Lord for small pawns. We dance for a while. At some point, Talia heads back to the guest house with Ahmed Blondie to get her Yemenite on. Raul and I take a seat on a pile of fleece jackets in the corner. Not many words are exchanged, not because we are too busy making out, but because Raul speaks no English, and words like how much and the number five don't leave much room for meaningful conversation. I can't tell if Raul is smart or dumb as a doorknob. When you're that handsome, the world assumes you're not bright. God giveth, God taketh away. But that's not really fair, is it? And does it really matter? It's not like Raul is coming back to live with me at the grad center at Brown to discuss postmodernist tropes over some celestial seasonings. But I can't help it. I need to see what's beyond the beauty. I'm that deep. <laughs> Actually, scratch that. Right now, all I want to experience is the magic that is naked Inca. I can see it now. My grandchildren sitting at my feet, staring up at Grandma for words of wisdom. Yes, my beloved little ones, I would tell them. Lust can conquer all. You may be short and neurotic and not have boobs as big as your best friend, but when everyone else looks kind of mediocre, the hottest guy in town will want to fuck you, and you need to know that and enjoy that and not give a shit if he has a brain. Now be a doll and get your grandmother her bedpan. <laughs> I can only imagine what Raul's life is like, fucking different backpackerettes every night, not bothering to learn another language, thereby saving his small brain from actually having to respond to women's unnecessary requirements for dialogue. The man has it down. <laughs> Raul takes me outside and kisses me. I try to erase the mental image of thousands of mouths before me and enjoy the moment. Do you want to go back to your place, I ask? In essence, it comes out as, from one to five, how much you want me and your house? Sure, he says, but my friend is staying there. Your friend? Yes, Lital. She is a beautiful Israeli girl. What the fuck? Don't worry, she is like sister. She stay with me, but she happy if you come stay too. Well, I guess that makes sense. Don't get all high maintenance now, woman. None of the other backpackerettes did. Sure, I'd love to meet Lital. Roll and I rush back to his place, equally horny and excited. His ground floor pad is nestled in between two best pizza and Cusco joints. He opens the door to reveal a room inhabited entirely by a large bed. In the bed lies a tiny pixieish blonde woman who looks like Tweety Bird pushing 40. She puts down the book she's reading. Rauli, she yelps, jumping out of the bed in sensible, off-white underwear. Her face may be 40, but her body is 14-year-old boy. She gives Raul a kiss on the cheek and then looks at me. Alan, I'm Lital, she says, hugging me on her tippy toes. Raul strips down to his AC Milano boxer briefs and hops into bed. Lital hops back into bed, too. I must say I didn't anticipate one sleeping sight for the three of us. 
How are Ola and I supposed to have crazy Inca sex with this Tolkien-esque creature literally lying right there for the duration? You coming to bed, Raul asks, making room for me between the two of them. My options are pretty limited. Leave now or dive in. From the producers who brought you The Little Mermaid and Finding Nemo comes the new Pixar porn extravaganza. Tweety Pan and Raul Cusack double-team The Princess of Zion. (laughs) Now available on Blu-ray. I strip down to my thong and tank top and crawl into the bed, nestling awkwardly between the two of them. The bed definitely looked wider from a foot away. In fact, my left leg is touching Raoul's and my right, Lital's. Bitch got toenails. <laughs> Raoul starts kissing me. Now, if Tweety Pen were actually watching or even snoozing innocently beside us, I might have felt some semblance of a kinky sexual vibe. But she just goes back to reading her book, <laughs> flipping the pages faster and louder than normal reading would warrant. Raul pulls me closer, the page turning more a crumpling action now. This is getting ridiculous. I don't know how the other backpackerettes did it, but I can't. Let's say this for another night, Raul. Bien, Irisita, no problema, buenas noches. He turns off the light and moves onto his stomach, preventing any spoonage opportunity. I move closer to him, trying to avoid leg contact with Tweety Pan, but she keeps moving her legs closer to mine. I finally give up, letting her big toenail dig into my calf muscle. I'm too exhausted to fight. I fall asleep fairly quickly, but awaken a few hours later with a horrible feeling that something bad has just happened. I open my eyes. The windowless room is pitch black. What's wrong? I mean, besides the fact that I'm sharing a bed with an Incan man whore and a prepubescent yet aging cartoon character. (laughs) Raul and Tweety are sleeping like twin babies, their shallow breathing in perfect sync. I take a breath and realize with dread what has happened. I reach down to feel my underwear. Yeah, it's damp. Uber damp. I've gotten my period. We're talking heavy flow. Oh, fuck. Did I leak on his sheets? I must have leaked on his sheets. I'm wearing thong underwear, for Christ's sake. (laughs) Only this could happen to me. Only I could get my period while nestled in a foreign bed flanked by strangers. (laughs) I turn on the light, and lo and behold, there is a massive bloodstain on the sheets, right where it should be. In a panic, I take off my drenched underwear and throw on my jeans, stuffing them with so much toilet paper that I am left with a penis-like bulge in my crotch. (laughs) Todo bien, Irisita? Raul asks fuzzily. Shit. I quickly toss my bloody underwear under the bed. Yes, of course, of course, I'm just taking a break from spooning. Intimacy issues, you know how it is. Before he questions any further, I hit the light switch and run out, praying to the saint of embarrassing menstrual events that Raoul never checks under his bed and prefers to change his sheets with his eyes closed. (laughs) So much for my first sexcapade in South America. Back at the guest house, Talia is showered and ready for breakfast. She has a Yemenite post-coital glow about her and looks confused as I enter all crusty and frustrated. How was last night, she asks. Fine, I got my period all over Raul's bed, which he shares with a middle-aged eagle woman. (laughs) Oh, no. Yeah, I ran out before they woke up. I did leave my bloody underwear as a memento, though. That's fucked up. (laughs) Flashback. Lewd interlude number one, or previous period trauma 3B. A week after my return from Asia, I headed down to the Sinai Desert to soften the transition back to normal living. I was accompanied by Rami, a young gentleman blessed with black curls, a pot belly, and unclear intentions. It was summertime and the Sinai was unbearably hot. We were staying in a wood hexagon-shaped hut that had huge cut-out square holes as windows. We shared it with a few other stoners who came to Sinai to smoke, snorkel, and recoup. We'd all been lying on the sand all day, and I was trying to find an opportune moment to go back to the hut and change my tampon when nobody else was there, since the actual bathroom doubled as a fat fly sauna, and getting there involved a Sisyphean climb up a massive scorching hot sand dune and ogling Bedouins. To my delight, our hut was empty. Mind you, I could have been honest with Rami. We were at that fresh phase in the relationship where I was still leading him to believe I didn't shit, fart, or bleed out of my hoo-ha. So no mention of my cycle had come up. I tried to find an angle where nobody could see me through the massive square window holes. I removed the used tampon and had the other one ready when suddenly I spotted Rami heading back to the hut at breakneck speed. Why? What did he want? What was I going to do with the bloody tampon in my hand? The window opposite the entryway was my only option. I toss it through there and then pick it up out of the sand the minute Rami left. Perfect. I flung the tampon discus-like toward the window. It was supersized and displayed an impressive trajectory. (laughs) My aim, however, was not impressive, and the objet d'art missed the window by a foot and smacked into the wall with a wet thud, (laughs) sticking to the wood as if my blood were superglue. I watched horrified as it stuck there for a moment before slowly oozing down the wall, leaving a long, bloody trail in its wake finally landing on top of my sleeping bag with a wet... (laughs) Rami entered to find me in my underwear looking like a menstruating deer in headlights. I prayed that he wouldn't notice the blood on the wall. Oh my God, is that blood on the wall? He asked, appalled. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, huge mosquito. I just killed it. Huge. Must have been pregnant. I feel horrible. Like a real, like a real killer. Real killer. The tampon looked at me up from its resting place. I could hear it hiss through its drenched fibers. You're a fucking coward, lady. I'm a necessary part of the female cycle. You bleed on me and discard me and can't even acknowledge your cruelty with dignity. I hate you. (laughs) Rami looked at the blood path like a frustrated art director. He shook his head, grabbed a book from his bag, and ambled back to the beach. I grabbed the pissed-off tampon, wrapped it in toilet paper, and headed deep into the desert for a dignified cremation ceremony, away from judgmental spectators, family, and friends. It was the least I could do. (laughs) Sorry, I don't know if that second segment was too long. No, 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 my gosh, not at all. Has anything ever happened like this since then? Since uh, Sleeping with Strangers, no. Odd menstrual events... Well, that was a period in your life. I mean, you were backpacking, no obviously. No pun intended. And now you don't, I mean, yeah. and by the way, I what is the go. word yeah. back, back, packerette? No, that's not a word. It is now. My now it, it, it won't is. come in. Nothing it's else. It's just a backpacker who's a girl. Yeah, is that yeah, a backpackerette? No, but to me, a backpackerette is very much like a, a, a cheerleader. Like a the et, the et part makes the person seem very small. Very young Cute. and go, <laughs> yeah, that's like accurate. there's no there's no like six foot tall backpacker right that would not be a there's a, like a woman who could actually could handle herself going through the jungle right that's not a backpacker right okay. it's a girl who should be in a mall and for some reason has found herself yeah yeah and that's how you felt like when you took this kind of this kind of journey this kind of adventure um I, besides the the cute rambunctious part yeah no I mean I you know because no but you are very hardy in stock in terms of like the last time well, I think she was referring to all the women who had been in the bed before. Yeah, yeah. That was talking about the um the whitewater not, rafting trip. She no, is no, not no, no, a, the um the women that were sleeping with with Raul right. prior to my arrival. They right. were the backpack. All the women that were backpacking. Oh, they were cute. I see. Just so okay. anyone who's hot. Okay. So that he, he ended up sleeping with. Oh wow. <coughs> okay. It was a lot. Horse. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever see him again? No. Well, we hung out for a few days after that, actually. Right. He didn't mention. The, Did you the see period. Tweety in the in the area? I did see Tweety in there. She was fri- she was a little frightening. She was was little it frightening. a village? Was it like a little village? Cusco away? is the um, is the jumping off point for Machu Picchu. So oh, I see. Every, so it's a very tourist heavy or backpacker friendly place. So it's very transient. People are coming and going and Yeah, it's like a, it's like the hub of I Peru. See. If you go to Peru, you, you fly So he Cusco. just is literally just girls he's a coming man through whore. all yeah, the yeah, yeah. time. And he's he was he literally gorgeous. Like And how old do you think he was? 25, 35? He was probably like 27. Oh, 27. Something that like that. Is just he was perfect, perfection, but he really was not the sharpest tool in the shed. And after like two days, and we didn't ever had, we never ended up not we having sex. We never did. It was just that oh, making out, making out. Yeah, yeah. What was the fleece? That's the blankets. Well, no, no, no. Like the fleece jackets, like all the backpackers, you know. And then people would steal them. Locals would steal the fleece. It was like a very coveted item back in the day when I was in South America. So if you'd go to a club and you'd leave your like your Patagonia mm-hmm. fleece thing in the corner, yeah. it would disappear within seconds. That's terrible. And then I remember in in, in Bogota, which at the time was very dangerous, um, mm-hmm. we stayed in a guest house in a very shitty area. And you know Israelis are tough, ex- you know, especially the men, the little macho, okay. right? And one guy went out and was mugged, and this guy wanted his fleece, and he goes, I'm not giving you my fleece. <laughs> and he got stabbed in the throat, literally. Oh my and then gosh. my friend, who's a, who was a medic in the army, took care of him. But, like, what guy is like, you know, I'm not giving you my... Like, give, him right. the, give him the fucking fleece. Well, it's sort of like tennis shoes, I suppose. I mean, maybe, yeah. you know, in Hot America, commodity. sometimes you yeah. hear that. Yeah, I know. He was used to hang, you know, being around people who would not stab you in the throat for a fleece jacket. Exactly. They'd be like, I'm not giving it to you. Okay, thanks. And they would walk away. It's like, yeah, there. Yeah, I know. It's, it's the difference between reading... The guy who figures, well, I can intim, you know, if I ask for it and pretend I'm going to be violent, you'll give me what I want. And the guy who really hopes that you don't give him what he's asking for. <laughs> yeah. That he's like, oh, please don't give me the fleece. Don't give me your yeah. wallet. I and want then, a chance to kill yeah, you. Yeah. Well, now, that's, Arise, yeah. this book, Machu Mai Picchu, is yes. so darn entertaining. Thank it's you. a beautiful yellow cover, and it has uh, chili peppers on the front. It's they appear to attractive. be making love to they my are. dirty yes, mind. This is, is your second book. The first book was yes. Dork Horror. Yes. But this one, Machu Mai Picchu, is specifically about adventures in South America. Yeah, Dorker was about me losing my virginity in Asia. Right. Like every Israeli, I, I traveled. Um, By the way, does that count for the rest of the world? Why? Or you're still, or if you lose your virginity to an no, Asian. No, no, you're still you re lose it in every location. Right, right. I'm also, Asians are so small, it's like it was still, you were still <laughs> right. a virgin. No, that's right. what people think. Think I go, I was going to sleep with Asians. And um, and that was not the, it was just a that, backpacking trip after the army. Everybody goes and, and roams around. And the year after. Now, are you, uh, I'm sorry, are you. An Amer- 
you're an Israeli citizen or you're co-American and you're Israeli? I'm a dual, dual You're a dual. So Thank you. you. I couldn't think of the word. one year of service or was it two, two, years? two years? Two years of yeah. service and then a lot of people take a couple of months and hang out. Six months to a year. Wow, that's yeah. wonderful. And then when I, after I started, I went to Brown for my undergrad and then um, that's the book starts with my time at Brown and then I also left for South America uh, during in between my first year and second year. And now you've done a lot of that traveling. Now, do you think, because now you're a mother, you have a child, a small a small yeah, baby, yeah. do you think most of that is in your past? I mean, it, yeah, I mean, I hope not. I haven't taken a long trip. You know, once you start life, and, you know, as an actor, too, you have that illusion of, like, if I leave, all the work will come. Do you know what I mean? And then right. you end up staying, and then there's no work, and then you leave for three days to San Diego, and, right, like, they, they say, wanted you for this show, but right. you weren't in town. Yeah, they said you had to be there within 15 minutes. Yeah. That's the crazy part about that it's people outside that. of show business don't understand. It's like there's a line for thousands of people, and they call you, and they want you to come in an hour. Yeah. And if you yeah. don't, they call the next no, guy. No, really doesn't happen. That every time I've left the country, there was work. You know what yeah. I mean? Right. And I always have to cancel trips. That's how I know I have to get work. I book a flight and then I cancel it. I lose money because I cancel flights, so I get work. <laughs> so you should just right. book flights to places you're not well, even exactly. interested in. Sometimes you just have to turn the job down. Right? Well, it's happened. I mean, yeah, it's sure. happened many times. Sometimes yeah. if I but have But going to, for six months is like a whole other... That's true. You know. Now, if I have to turn something down, sometimes I say to myself, well, the only power we have is to say No. Because well, I really wanted a, to say that's yes. That's a nice cognitive dissonance way of doing it. But I'm, turn, with I'm spinning it. Yeah, it's like when a pigeon spin. takes a shit and they go, it's good luck. That's you know exactly that? I don't right. know if that's a, just a Jewish thing. <laughs> I remember I've never that, heard when that. When I was funny. a kid, yeah, when it, yeah. you step in shit or a pigeon takes a shit on you, it's good luck. And I'm like, is this just Jews trying to make ourselves feel better when something right. bad happens? Like, I literally, when I was a kid, a pigeon took a huge dump on my head. My mom's like, hey, it's good luck. And I'm like, how is this? <laughs> You've had some good luck in your life, though. So maybe that. Maybe I don't know. I've worked hard. I don't, I'm not a big believer in luck or bad luck or good luck. I just work my ass off. Like, no, people I, are like, you're so lucky. I'm like, mm, I don't think it's luck lucky. Luck have I, a lot to do with it. Yeah. Not but not according to Ashton Kutcher. That's true. Everybody's like raving about his his brilliant, profound speech, thing. Yeah, which was, was like, like, don't quit a job unless you have another job, which is good advice. Yeah, no, look, it could have been But it's shallow, not brilliant advice. But it was better than what people expect him to go like, hey, girls. You know what I mean? Like, I guess Yeah, he's was, like, hey, because you got to be good looking like me. Because he got like 20. Yeah. I mean, his success came very early. Yeah, it wasn't like he was 40 and still like catering 20. on I mean, the how Intrepid. how hard did he Which try? I did. Right. Yeah. On the In Intrepid? Words, yeah, I was 40. This was like, I was just after college, I was worked for a catering company in New York, which was a nightmare. And then we had a gig on the, that's when I quit. It was on the Intrepid, you know, that, that uh, aircraft carrier that parks in oh, New York. Oh, I see. That's what it is. And it was right. summertime and you have to wear a tuxedo when you're catering. Oh my gosh. I hate that black and, and white. And you're on the yeah. freaking deck of the Intrepid serving food and I couldn't get, I couldn't hold, I'm too small to hold two plates at once and the gravy and I was spilling it at near Al Gore's table. I don't know who was there. Like all these important people were there. <laughs> <laughs> and the guys were yelling at me, and I just I just quit that day. I'm like, for 10 bucks an hour, am I really getting yelled at for the gravy spoon? I mean... How long had you worked with this company, with the catering? Oh, no, I didn't last long. At, so I like a couple jobs I didn't last four, long or five. At. A few months, or maybe yeah. a few, we've gotten a few weeks, maybe. Probably a few yeah. weeks. No, 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 I've definitely had jobs like that. Yeah, it yeah, doesn't yeah. last. It just doesn't work. Well, it's too it's too much. Right. I could have gone on to be, you know, a supervisor if I had stuck there a couple no, of years, but that would have been you're suicide. You're not meant to do that. Well, no. nobody's going to, we don't want you to waste your talent Thank catering you. on the Intrepid, yeah. please. Well, it was an experience. It's funny, because this, this really hot guy at Brown, another not-so-sharp tool in the shed, forgot his name, we hung out senior and nothing ever happened because he, he, he also had reindeers on his socks. That was his thing. He, well, that's a problem. <laughs> he was a beautiful guy in the crew team. Anyway, I'm on the Intrepid catering and it was Marines were there and they're all in their beautiful whites and I yeah, see him and I'm like, hot. oh, you became a, a Marine. Like, and I go up to him, I'm like, hey, I forgot his name. I'm like, Chris, is, you know, it's Erase. We hung out and he's like not I didn't even say his name. He's not I don't remember his name. I'm like, hey. You. And he's just staring at me. And it's embarrassing because he's at a table with like 30 Marines. And I look like a psycho. I'm like, dude, your reindeer sucks. He's like, what in God? I'm like, am I delusional? <laughs> and I go on and on. And after 40 minutes of this, he goes, oh, it must have been my twin brother. He went to Brown. Now, oh, <laughs> he probably gets this a lot. Why didn't you tell me this after because minute you one? Were like, so he's, entertaining. No, because he was so dumb. He oh. couldn't even put two and two together going, maybe she's confusing me with my twin. I'm like, for an hour, I'm like, we hung out. You wore reindeer socks. We, so there were brown. twins. They got all looks and no brains between the two of them. Yeah, literally. They, the, the now, see, half the a thing, though, lo- lobe. Taking these sorts of jobs and, and having many of them, yeah. that gives you, as it were, a life. I mean, in other words, you're doing new experiences, you're trying sure. out things, you're taking chances. Sure. And so therefore, it translates into your writing, I think. Sure, and so like Ashton you, Kutcher. You have something yes. to say. Yes. Well, you have something to say. No, but yeah, there's something about no, that. I agree. And so, and so this is probably why, you know, you've had these experiences and it leads to, you, yeah. you never took the safe path. No, no. Why would we do that? I don't even know if I would recognize and it. And that brings me to No, you, you would because you'd start yawning. 
Yeah. That's why every time I get terrified, I think I'm terrified of the safe path. I think a lot of people are terrified of that Mm -hmm. in a weird way. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you don't know what's happening, it's that uncertainty and and danger. You know what I mean? Oh, see, what I always think of the safe path is certainty is the I can take this job, I can work in this office, and I can be here for 20 years, and I know what's going to happen. And that's terrifying. And what terrifies me is that I'm just, I've worked in office jobs where you're like, it can be the nicest place yeah. in the world, and they can give you all the free coffee you want, and they give you free CDs, and you have a view even though you're a temp, and you look at a window, and three hours in, you're like, I'm in a fucking prison cell. Yeah, well, of course. I I'm in like a well that with big houses in the suburbs. You know, all my yeah, sisters yeah. and everybody in the Midwest, they've got these great houses. Well, not just in the Midwest. Every, you know, yeah. Yeah. right outside of Los Angeles, people are living in these big homes, and I think, but then there you are, sitting in your big home, and nobody's around. Right, it's yeah. like you're under house arrest. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. so <laughs> I feel that in LA sometimes times too though because it's you don't see too many people walking the streets and it's I, oh, I always think like no. in LA you could be dead for three weeks and nobody would know no like I, nobody I would find that comforting I don't know, know why <laughs> I like that <laughs> they're always like New York as I have a friend who has a theory the reason the streets of New York are was teeming with people is everyone lives in such a shithole they want to get that out they cannot stand to spend more than 10 minutes at home right right so right. like I gotta go out to four in the morning because I live in a closet that's yeah funny. you know how they would know if I died is because my LA times would pile up and That's they'd be right. like, they just complain. They now, give you kids, a complaint I note, still right? Get Am the I right? Let me yes. explain to you, kids listening. <laughs> LA Times is a newspaper. Now, what you used to do is print information on paper. Paper is made out of pulp. Yeah. Hey, okay. listen, here's what I want to ask you, Iris. Tell us about living in Tel Aviv because you have only been back, you kind of been going back yeah, and forth yeah. from Israel I've been bi-coastal. to the States. Yeah. yeah. And so, what is it like living there in that kind uh, of, in that region of so much unrest and knowing that your neighbors, like people right over well, there? Well, Tel Aviv is a, is a bubble. Um, Tel Aviv is the most, like, festively happening city that I've ever been to on the planet and I've been all over it's like it's non-stop I think that the one thing about Israeli mentality is that yeah you could die tomorrow you know what I mean there is that kind of carpe diem mentality all the time so people yeah. really so it's kind of like uh, London during the Blitz in World yeah, War II yeah suck the it's marrow like- out of life people have fun All the people have no money in the bank everyone's struggling but they're still going out and taking vacations and yeah. know, their bank accounts are overdraft you know there's overdraft in everyone's bank accounts it's a very stressful existence it's very hard to exist financially like there's very wealthy people and people that are struggling it's it's hard it's extreme you know the income taxes is super high but people have fun like there's the restaurants are open you, at three in the morning, you, there's like so a plethora of places. To eat. Yeah, that but respect. beyond that, yeah, and then you have the beach. You know, so Tel Aviv is not. What's in, the taxes? What's the tax rate? I don't. It's like I don't know. It's so much. I went there and I was like sixty percent of like my income just disappears, and you have this and this fee and that fee, and it's like it's ins- it's very hard to make a living, and yeah. people that are artists have an extremely hard time. And so how do they live in apartments? They, they live, share, yeah, they yeah. Do, like I mean, New York. You do what you got to do, exactly. Place, it's a a- actors, they're also, unlike unlike here, I have to say, like here, if you're an actor and you're not working, you're, you're waiting tables right. or whatever, there they all work in acting, but they'll do children's plays and they'll do, you know, they'll tour the country and they'll, they'll be it's acting. Kinda, it's a respected uh, career. Yeah. It's a and respected, also, yeah, you're acting, you're doing a million different jobs just to make ends meet, it's but it's all acting. because people want to see entertainment. So in other words... It's respected also because I think people train, just like they do in England, being an actor is, is, yeah. is respected because people actually go and study and train and take it seriously. It's not like, I'm pretty, I'm from Ohio, I'm going to get a, a job right. on the CW. I learned, uh, yeah, I can right. learn how to do one thing yeah. and uh, that thing will be... I I will and get they, a show on, you know, I'll be the, te- reason, the hot technician on a CSI show. Yeah, it they, always reminds me of a Jackie Kennedy once told John Kennedy that he didn't, she didn't want him dating Daryl Hannah because she was just an actress or something. Right. And until I heard that, I had never, ever thought that somebody wouldn't think of an actress as like a respectable thing. I think it's a respectable well, thing. Well, considering her. to be able to, you know, yeah. do it justice. I yes, think she I just guess. had a thing against blonde actresses since her husband had been maybe. like banging Marilyn yeah. Monroe. <laughs> maybe that had something to do yeah, with maybe. it. I don't know. A little bit. But a you're right. Bit. The way, because in, in Europe, I mean, in England and yeah. all of Europe, it's like people are trained to be an actor the way you are trained to be an engineer yeah. you have a multiple set of skills and people are always like wow well, how come these english guys can like they can do comedy and they can do drama and they can do action movies it's like because they know how to act but it's also they're not most of them i guess when you're living in england I mean, this is not all for true for all of them but they don't have aspirations to be famous so to speak just for that you know what mm-hmm, i mean mm-hmm. they're doing shows they're doing shakes they're doing plays they're doing right. theater they're doing the work same with stand-up comedians like when you go to England or Ireland or Scotland, you know, when you do the Fringe in Edinburgh, yeah. these guys are stand-ups. That's their career. They're not coming out here 
to do 20 minutes a and a showcase and get the sitcom. Right, you know and it's mean? also different because it's small. You know how we yeah. said if you leave L.A., work comes. It's like Israel and England. These are like, you can be on tour with a children's play in Israel if they want you to for a TV show on Tel Aviv. Yeah, how many back. hours could that be? Two hours? Yeah, yeah, exactly. To get back? It's, <laughs> it's like, it's like it's New true. Hampshire or it's something. True. Yeah. And in England, too, it's like it's getting back to London that's not going to be that hard. Yeah. So listen, before we, and you'll play some Shotgun Story with I will, us. Of course I will. Uh, before we play Shotgun, let me ask you this. Tell us where Svetlana, wh- what's the state of Svetlana right Svetlana, now? Svetlana uh, is on a hiatus. St. Petersburg House of Discreet Pleasure uh, is, you know, the inspectors <laughs> came and they found some, some sketches. <laughs> Was Larry the Cable Guy one of the inspectors? Fluids. Yeah, exactly. No, you know, I uh, I did two seasons. Uh, okay. And um, on, it was on cable. Everybody right. thinks it was a web series because HDNet sounds like an internet. But Isn't it's not. It was cables. Okay, Twenty wait. million viewers. It was cable station. Say so it again. You were so, getting. Yeah. How many viewers were you getting? Well, I, well, I don't know how. I you know the the network had twenty million or no that kidding. slot that time slot had twenty million viewers. But people didn't. Still, people don't know HD. You know what I mean? And Mark Cuban um, ended up selling it, or I think it's it's turned into <clears throat> Access TV, which I think is mostly live music. And so there was no, you know, it's not. Wait, yeah, A- AXS TV? Yeah, uh-huh. Oh, I've seen that station. Okay. There's yeah. all these different, yeah, letters and combinations, and then they put TV on the end and nobody knows. Yeah, well, HDNet, I think they were the first high definition network ever. So at the time, net didn't sound like it was a website. You know, it was like network, HD right. network. Right. So, so that's but been it was where very else confusing. Is, Svetlana? is it on YouTube? Is it on Yeah, Premier you can Dye? find uh, YouTube. And if you go to my website, I mean, I don't know if the links, there are other full episodes on Vimeo that I have, that, you know. On that, Vimeo, right. Yeah, yeah. I think if you. Uh, if you Google, you'll probably only find clips. It's very, very, But I have my new character, Ray Lynn Casper White. I don't know if you caught I have her. Known the Ray pregnant, Lynn. That's the right. pregnant character. Have you seen her? I've I've seen little bits. Little of bits, yeah. yeah. Because when you were pregnant, you took advantage. Yeah, I looked of that like a time. truck. I mean, and was, so yeah. that's interesting, Reese. As an actress, you got pregnant, and and so you say, well, now I have another character, don't I? Yeah. Well, especially since you know you go through all you read books and you do this and you try and find out this stuff and it's all terrifying and annoying. And I'm like, I just got to dish it out. But most women don't get pretty much naked and yeah. then put themselves on tape. I mean, you were in so many compromising positions. I was indeed, literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing, doing Ray Lynn. And where do people find Ray Lynn? Oh, man. Ray Lynn, you just you, YouTube. Ray Lynn Casper White. R A E L Y N N. Casper, like Casper, C A S P A R White. You have balls, man. You Thank really you. do. You I look are, at my go, I'm like, I was huge. I was like, it was like, you it was have, horrifying. You are amazing to do that, really. I'm impressed. Yeah, you were so I mean, pregnant, you actually grew balls. That's yes, thank how. You. Wow. But yeah. I can't think of another woman who put herself in that position. I mean, I, I'm not talking about just getting naked at a beautiful. A beauty no, I remember shot she's rolling around on top of some I'm guy, about telling that. him how to how to uh, how, to, how to eat out. I was going to say go down, but go yeah. up on a pregnant woman. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, hey, let's play some shotgun story with you. Let's do it. Music can only mean one thing. It's time for Shotgun Storyworthy. The game where our storyteller spins the storyworthy wheel of truth and tells a true one-minute story about the topic it lands on. So everybody, say it with me. Spin that wheel! Pets. Oh boy. Okay. Pets. Um, well, I had a beautiful Persian cat named uh, Chuck that I had for many years that I got at a tiny shelter in New York City. And I uh, decided to sublet my home to these two very cute, responsible girls from Texas who promised to take good care of my cat um, when I was in Israel um, dealing with my pregnancy. And I told them a million times, I said, whatever you do, don't open the front door. He's an, out, you know, he's an indoor cat. He's never been outside. He's not the sharpest cat in the shed. He would fall asleep in the middle of the street kind of cat. And of course, two months later, I get an email going, uh, Chuck is gone. We lost him probably eaten by a coyote within 30 seconds. Yeah. And that was the end of Chuck, and it was very sad. And I'm sorry to end on a bad note, but there goes my cat. Oh. All right, dead cat story, right. yeah. Hey, you know what? Just to levy that out, just to kind of put some levity to that, the <laughs> dead that cat story. story? No, oh. no, I'm just going to tell a quick fun cat story so that we're not all so depressed when we leave here with the Reese Bar. <laughs> right. One time my father was staying with me here in L.A., and he was sleeping on the sofa bed in the apartment, right? So in the morning, my dad puts the sofa bed away, whatever, and we get in the car. We go to Ojai for the day. We do the. You came with us, Hannes. Did I? Yeah, me and my dad picked you up. My dad. Oh, that's paid right. For you lunch. wanted me as a buffer. That's I always had to have a buffer, buffer around smart. my parents. Buffer smart. I still like to yeah. have a buffer around my parents. My dad's been dead, dead a long time, really? so I'm like, you know, a sucker for an old man who tells stories Aww. that she's heard a million times, and I'll be like, "That's nice." 
Yeah. Oh, no, my dad's great. Anyway, so no, no, he's, he's for the swell, day. We but back. he's still an old man who tells the same story every time we I see him. come back at the end of the day at 6, 7 o'clock at night, and uh, we call the cat, call the cat, Daisy, Daisy, no cat, no cat. Then we hear, <laughs> and we hear that a couple of times. You know where the cat was, Iris? In the sofa bed. Oh, no. He had closed the cat oh, in no. the sofa bed. How is this a funnier story when than my dead cat story? It up, well, it she lived, looked like I guess. a cartoon character cat. She Poor was guy. so flat, and then no. she shook it out. And, uh, you know, it all worked out. <laughs> and a dead okay. mouse popped out. All right, yeah. all right. I need to find, I think of a cat story where, like, no one abuses or kills the cat. Um, I did, there, was a, I did, there was a party once in high school where they put a cat in the microwave. These things horrify me. Oh, oh well, that's, that's, that's not a good party. No. Yeah, that's a sociopath. That's no, a, that was a, horrible. Okay, let me yeah. ask you, before we go, yeah. uh, how is it being a mom? Tell me about being a mom. Ooh, is this really for like one minute? Well, this could no, be like six no, hours. Not a minute at all. Just tell I me. I love being a mom. I mean, yeah. I you know, thing that kills me is the is obviously the lack of sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, breastfeeding was fun until you stop. Yeah. Turn well, everybody what? warned me because you know, I I I I was always very pleased with my breast, and I had a six pack on my stomach. These were the two body. You know, everybody has their favorite body I part. It was your what about ass? your ass? Just yeah. Your... Well, yeah, my ass too, but my stomach. But you know, I only can only focus on. I don't want to seem too. You know, right. I want to be humble. Okay. Right? So my ass was my best asset. <laughs> <laughs> I just You're thought crazy. of that. Oh, that is some Too comedy much. punning right there. Is, I mean, think about it. Where did that come you from? You know, classical training in England, that doesn't get you that kind of no, humor. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> um, Anyhow, some more about your breasts. Yeah, more about my boobs. So, and then, you know, I, I was breastfeeding, and uh, I literally, when I was pregnant, I was so excited by the size of my breasts that I took photos of my, I think I have 2,000 photos of my boobs. If someone finds my iPhone, they are just, they're they're having a ball Terrific. right now. Every day, because they were they got huge. They were orbs. They yes. were like massive. I remember being overwhelmed. Oh no, my god! Yours, my and, own. But I didn't. I didn't start with my. You know, I started with like mm-hmm. they're fun. They're perky. They're fetch. But suddenly it's like, good lord, man! Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and everyone kept uh, warning me. Oh, and after you breastfeed, they're gonna they're gonna flatten out. They're gonna sag. They're gonna shrink. You know. And I'm like, no, 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 not not mine. Mine will sustain their beautific. You mm-hmm. know, beautific. No, what does beautific mean? It's not beauteous, but beautific means something else. Perfection. Beautific, really? Whatever. Like it's their boobs. Champagne it's fine. glass? Keep okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Roundness, so you, and then they... Sean yeah. is smiling. Boy, now we got his attention. Yeah, well... Um, and then, okay, so finally, I was so scared that once you're done breastfeeding, like, they're going to hit the floor. You know what I mean? Right, like, I you get see it. What, the deflation. Yeah, like, it's just horrible. So I stopped breastfeeding, and, um, well, he didn't want any more at this point. He's like, I'm done. He's like, 17. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm, I'm the next time cover, like, the kid is 23, and he's yeah, still at yeah, my breast. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and you're angling your ass toward the camera, yeah, so you exactly. can see your giant boob oh, with God. a seven foot tall That's Inca man. Horrible. Um, <laughs> and I was happy that I am happy to report they didn't sag, but they, they something you know how like something happens, like your whole body changes. You know, I was a tr- I was huge when I was pregnant. I gained so much weight all in my stomach. How much did you gain? I don't know in kilos. I think I gained like I don't know, probably fifty pounds, I, a yeah. shitload of weight. A I mean, I just, and you're a tiny girl. Yeah, exactly. So it was all in my stomach. You know, like just pushing out. If you right. watch Ray Lynn, you'll see how large. Right, I, exactly. I know. Yeah. I look like I Optimum. Know yeah, I'd be watching that So now that the stomach's later. not the same that it used to. You know, there's there was it's stretched. You made a yes, human. You made a true. freaking it's human. It's true. But that's a badge of honor. I mean, that's incredible, right? Like, it's the mass of But then you see women like lives. Jessica Alba that, you know, pop out several kids and, like, two weeks later, yeah, I'm know. like, who are you? Their but entire job is to exactly. look good. They so the they spend eight to the, ten hours a day every day. The, like, what about the love of the baby? Yeah, yeah, whatever. Let's yeah, go back yeah, to my no, body Back to the, the boobs. <laughs> I mean, Jesus. let's, like, the love yeah, of the baby Yeah, 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 I mean, given. human being. Yeah, I hung out with a, a, a friend of mine who's not, not a kid person. First thing she goes, she goes, Oh, your kid has a funny face. I'm like, well, thanks. That's that's. I guess she thought he was cute, but it just came out yeah. wrong. And then she, you know, she's sitting there going, "Do you love him?" And I'm like, "Yeah, <laughs> I do love him." Like I was getting annoyed. I'm like, "Do I really?" You know. And then and then what else did she say? She goes, and then she, we were playing, and I was kissing him. She goes, "Yeah, I can tell you like him." And I'm like, "Okay, this What's is like what?" Well, yeah, that's that's, that's not a this is not like, kid person. That's a sociopath. Yeah, it's like this weird. I go, "Don't have kids." She goes, "Oh, I didn't ask." I go, "I know. I'm just I'm just sharing my thoughts right, right. now." Like you're it not really right. adds to your life though, doesn't it? Like, oh my me, god. I well, it beyond adds. I mean, it just transforms. Yeah, it. There, there's just so many different yeah. reasons to. Yeah. Want to well, do everything now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wait, I have a, I'm one more. Yeah. I have a boob question. Yes, Hang please. Back no, to just, uh, no, just, just do you think like job. a lot of women in L.A., <laughs> it's like they in childbirth and then they go and they get work done. Do you think you'll ever no, get a boob job to get maybe not all the way back to your 
beautificness. No, because I think they're back to where they way they were. They're just compared to what I the orbs. Now ah, they're like okay. pre. They're, look, they're a little diff. You know, look, they're not a little different. They're not as perfect as they were before. They're there are hand gestures you can't see that are being made. It goes, goes back to the way it was. It, I don't it, buy pretty it. Much. I also don't work out. Like people that work out actually do something. It changes, I'm yeah, just I don't work out. I'm like a vegetable. So you well, never did you ever have to work out before when you had the six pack? No, moment? that was the that was the ah, gift. I well, the see. thing is, is once your baby starts running, I'll be running. That'll be a whole different situation. Really, chasing your child. I don't know how people have time well to... I carry him so I have gr- crazy bicep I've got like the Michelle Obama arms because <laughs> right. I carry a 30 pound baby so that in my back you, you know need, what I mean now you need to just start doing leg lifts with him you know like yeah. on your back yeah, I try that but he's a, too yeah, big yeah as a he's chest uh, you know, yeah. pectoral lift hey listen yeah. we really appreciate you coming over today this has been a lot thank of fun thank you you are thank awfully you. It was talented awesome. and truly thank Reese, you, everything thank you do you. I laugh my ass off thank you and it's just really it's a treat to see great Cheers. women comedians don't you think guys yes it is alright you guys we're gonna wrap it up right about now I'd like to thank everybody for helping out the show today including Sean Merrick here at Sideshow Network also Jorge Reyes Joe Slepsky and of course, our storyteller today, Iris Barr. Woo. And on behalf of you, Hannes Finney, my dear Me. friend and co host, my name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a story worthy week. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to StoryWorthy on iTunes and visit the StoryWorthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Membership fees apply after free trial. Cancel any time. Can I be real for a second? That goal you have to exercise and eat better, you really can do it. But nobody is going to do it for you. And nobody has to because you can do it if you have the right tools and a community that cares about helping you get results. And that's us, Beachbody. It's as convenient as your TV or laptop, but you need to decide that you're worth it. Let us help you succeed. Here's how. Go to Beachbody.com to claim your free membership and start feeling great. Jeep Freedom Days are here, where right now, well-qualified returning FCA lessees get a low-mileage lease on the 2022 Grand Cherokee WK Laredo E4x4 for $369 a month for 36 months with $3,799 due at signing. Tax title license extra. No security deposit required. Call 1-888-925-JEEP for details. Requires dealer contribution at least across their capital. Lessee is responsible for termination fees. Current lease must end by 7-3-23. Extra charge for miles over $30,000. Residency restrictions apply. Take delivery by 7-5-22. Jeep is a registered trademark.